Kavita will now garland Dr. Swami. speak to you today about corruption and and its cure and I'll address what I am going to say in three parts. First I'll try to say define corruption because there's a lot of the word is used very loosely for almost everything. Second is why it's bad for the country. Corruption is not only just two people exchanging money, which is illegal, but it has a deep impact on the country. So in what way is that impact? And then finally I'll deal with the question of cure. Corruption for us has to be necessarily the misuse of public office for private gain. We cannot make everything corruption. Taking money in a dowry as a dowry is not corruption, it's extortion. <laughs> the Congress party recently accused uh, Swami Ramdev of her himself engaging in corruption by accepting black money. Now Congress had no explanation how is that black money. He said it's in cash, he accepts it's in cash. Supposing I'm a very corrupt person and I have a lot of black money and I carry it in my pocket and I go and buy taxi and when the fare time to come for me to pay the fare comes and I take out the cash and give it to the taxi driver. The taxi driver by accepting that cash cannot be called corrupt because the money was black. A, he doesn't know and B, there is no misuse of office. We are concerned essentially that people place faith in public officials and they are supposed to serve the country and do what is best for the country. And if they only do the, what's best for them, then that is corruption, that's mis misuse of office. So in that sense we define corruption and there is a specific act in the country called the Prevention of Corruption Act, under which public officials can be prosecuted. There is a provision in that which says that a public official cannot be prosecuted unless the appointing authority of that public official is satisfied that there is a prima facie case against that person. There, there is a filtering device because the government, the uh, parliament did not want to empower people to file cases against anybody at any time on the flimsiest of excuses. That would be harassment. Presently, the, our criminal law is such that anybody can go to a court and say the following offense has, been, has taken place and the police should be directed to investigate the matter and uh, prosecution should be launched. But in the case of public officials, you have to get a clearance. So if you want to prosecute a minister, you have to ask the chief minister in the state or the prime minister in the center. If you want to prosecute the prime minister, then you have to ask the president. If you want to prosecute the president, well, on what will you prosecute? Because the president acts on the advice of the, prime, uh, the cabinet. So therefore, there is no way you can prosecute the president under corruption law. Same thing with chief minister. If you want to prosecute the chief minister, you have to ask the governor 
for permission to go to court. So, therefore, let, let's be very clear, if you use your, misuse your power to benefit somebody or yourself, that is corruption and that is the part that we are concerned with. We are not concerned with uh, any other kind of corruption because that's not, doesn't have a nationwide impact. If you can cure this corruption, every other corruption, petty corruption would be uh, cured. If a policeman, after giving you a parking ticket, takes money and cancels your parking ticket, that's misuse of office. If a clerk uh, changes the files, the speed at which he made it moves because you gave him some money, that's also corruption because he's misusing his office. And the same thing if, if a minister gives a license for a person who's not deserving of it, then that's also corruption. So corruption, in a sense, <coughs> is misuse of public office to deny the choice by merit. People who should get something on merit, don't get it. And people who don't deserve it on merit, get it because they pay money. That's the corruption that uh, we are talking about. The impact of corruption is very widespread. It's not only that uh, choice by merit is not made, so an inferior choice is made. I bring out a tender for building a road and I tell pass the word around that whoever wants to get the tender will have to give me this much money. If the person who, who all those who apply or file applications for the tender, they think that that much of money if we give, then we will not make profit in making the road. So what happens is they still want the tender. So they give the money and then they use uh, substandard material on the road, which road can be washed off with one monsoon. We have horrible roads in India, not because we don't know how to build roads. We build the best roads in the world. We built lovely roads in Malaysia, in Nigeria. In fact, in, we built roads in Iraq. And President Bush, not knowing that the Indians had built that road in Iraq, when the American tanks went from Basra to Baghdad, he complimented, say, at least one thing Jafar, uh, Saddam Hussein did, he built good roads. Saddam Hussein didn't build those roads, built by Indians. We built very good roads everywhere in the world except in India, because of corruption. <laughs> Same thing with the houses we have built in Russia, in Bulgaria, and so many other places. So, consequently, because the choice is not of merit or merit, so substandard products are served to the public. Electricity is not available, there's power cut because of the fact that there's corruption. Electricity is being stolen and to make up for it they have give you power cuts. So the public suffers because of a lack of choice on merit. And those who want to do things on merit they are discouraged. So this is the first impact, it demoralizes the public. The second thing is that when you get money and it has to be in black, you can't give in check because check will be traced. What do you do with this money? Well, there are many things that are being done now. One is that I can't build a factory because that, that will also be, will come under the purview and it will come to the notice of the income tax. So therefore I spend the money. I go and dine every day in five star hotels. I hold big weddings. I put an air conditioner in every room including the bathroom. I buy six Mercedes cars. I buy, nowadays they buy even corporate jets. And these are something that uh, uh, ends up promoting luxury goods industries. The highest rates of return in Indian economy today are not in producing cloth for the millions, in not in producing food grains for the people. It's not in producing consumer go uh, goods which the common man uses.
but the highest rates of return today is in five star hotels in air conditioners it is in uh, in uh, luxury cars these are the places where you get the maximum return so what happens is the market forces then propel you to invest more and more in luxury goods and less and less in common man's good and the whole investment priorities of your country they get distorted today in india over 70% of our investment goes directly or indirectly to produce luxury goods this is this we cannot accept because so many people are poor and they divided they require a better deal similarly the money is used now because forward trading is allowed in food grains and agricultural products this black money is used to when the farmer is ready to bring the uh, the food grains sugar sugar cane all these things to the market industrialists with black money they or politicians with black money they buy these and prevent them from going to the market and then they put it in the go downs and then when the prices rise they sell and having uh, in, in, in the, since they sell it at that stage this is inflation india is having a growth rate of 9% per year and an inflation rate of 16% per year this is against the laws of economics if the supplies expand the demand prices should come down but in india supply is also expanding and prices also going up because of hoarding third thing is a device which uh, mr chidambaram has perfected at the advice of his boss sonia gandhi and that is sonia gandhi once is supposed to have complained to mr chidambaram when he was finance minister that these swiss people they are quite shameless people they take our deposits and then they instead of paying us interest they charge us a service charge so we have to pay them to keep our money so we have to find some way by which money can be earned so a new financial derivative was invented by the government of india which is called participatory notes nowhere in any country of in the world not a single other country in the world has this participatory note and what is this participatory note you send your money by hala abroad and then with this cash you go to morgan stanley or to fidelity investments and on the counter you put this cash and say give me a participatory note so they'll give you a piece of paper which will only have the amount it will not have your name it will have nothing you take that participatory note and come back to india and then through one of the mutual funds you buy shares after intimating the reserve bank that you've got this participatory note and you are going to use it in fact the mutual fund will do the informing to the reserve bank then this money infusion that has come into the stock market suddenly raises the stock market prices at the height of the stock market prices which you think is the high you sell out and that money that you get in rupees from the stock broker with your participatory note you go to the reserve bank and they are obliged under the law under obliged under the law to convert the entire amount into foreign exchange and give it to you and you can take it abroad the sebi this security exchange bureau of india which is an oversight body like your security exchange commission here in the united states they have been the law has been passed to exempt participatory note from examination by sebi otherwise if tomorrow you go honestly and buy shares sebi will ask you a question where do you get the money from who did you buy the shares from and where are you going to put your shares all kinds of questions they will ask you but on participatory note no questions there was only one loophole in all this that this participatory note because you sell it at the top you make a capital gains so there is a capital gains tax so to exempt that mr chidambaram bought a new regulation that if you come through mauritius 
on a one dollar company and invest in the stock market, then no capital gains tax because Mauritius is a poor country, a brotherly country, so we are going to exempt Mauritius. Today, Mauritius is the largest supplier of foreign investment to India. What has Mauritius got? It's supplying more foreign investment to India than the United States. Mauritius, what is there? There are beaches there, gambling casinos there. How they are investing so much? This is all your money going by that route and coming back. So here again, you find that your stock market is getting rigged. Your agriculture market is rigged. Your investment priorities have been rigged. The whole economy has got rigged. And therefore tomorrow, one of these days it can collapse. That's why we are having these stock market crashes, booms and busts all the time. So look at the impact of corruption. It's not my a minister getting some money and becoming rich. It is actually impacting the whole economy. It impacts your national security also. Because the Havala is done by people who generally 99.9% .9 owe allegiance to ISI of Pakistan. So Pakistan uh, obviously would know who is putting money abroad, who is uh, doing Havala operations abroad. They can blackmail you with it. And with that blackmail, they can acquire certain advantages. You will be surprised to know that India, when it prints its currency notes, has to import currency paper. It doesn't produce currency paper. The finance ministry decided that they will buy this uh, uh, currency paper from England, from a company called De La Rue. The intelligence bureau said, please don't buy it from De La Rue because De La Rue also sells currency paper to Pakistan. So they will buy your, because these currency papers are watermark and things like that. Then they will, you know, after all businessmen or business companies abroad or business companies abroad. Pakistanis will buy currency paper of India, ask them to print more and take it and then use that to bring in forged notes into India. ISI today is now supplying 15% of your money supply through fake currency notes. These fake currency notes are being used for financing terrorists. Pakistan over these last few years has developed such a network in India with this money that now no more need for a Kasab to come from Pakistan to blow up Bombay. Homegrown unemployed youths have been recruited, radicalized and now every city of India has got a cell of the Indian Mujahideen, which has affiliations of the Al-Qaeda. So your national security has also been affected. And once this greed for money starts growing, then you are prepared to do anything. What has happened in this 2G spectrum case? And why did I take it? I took it because I came to see that the amount of money was enormous. Later on, the CAG calculated as a loss of 1,76,000 crore rupees. When I presented this to the Supreme Court, the judge asked me, how many zeros is that? I said, 11 zeros. Say, Bapre Bap, I've never seen so many zeros in my life. This is the, the magnitude of corruption that is taking place in India today. Because it's a growing economy. Telecom is growing so fast. We were in 2001 only 40 million handsets. Today we are 700, we have 700 million handsets. Huge market and growing. But now people have two, two, three handsets. So consequently, when this 2G spectrum, how did this 2G spectrum, what is this 2G spectrum? You see, if I can simplify it, I'm, I don't want to do too much injustice to the science of airwaves, but let me simplify it. When you speak on a cordless phone, you only your voice can go. And it goes in long cycles. If you want to send email and SMS, then you have to have a higher 
frequency. That's called the second generation or 2G. A lot of people don't know what 2G is. In fact, I asked Manmohan Singh once, what is 2G? Jokingly. And he said, Sonia G and Rahul G. <laughs> There's only higher waves, you know. So more information. If you want to send video of you talking and seeing the other person who's received the phone, then you have to have 3G, which is an even more higher frequency. And the, the sky has to be partitioned. So it's a limited resource and when the demand goes up, the price for spectrum should go up. But both Raja and later I found out Chidambaram together were empowered to decide the price. And what price did they decide? They decided that we will give spectrum in 2008 at the price that was prevailing in 2001. That means the price which was 10 times more in 2008 was sold at one-tenth the price in 2001. So this is the first thing and this is what has caused the loss. If you had sold it at the market price in 2008, the country would have got 1,76,000, that is about $44 billion, $44 billion extra by which you could have wiped out your deficit, you could have financed your in infrastructure, so many things you could have done with it. It's all gone, because you sold it in this. Of course, Raja took two uh, more steps. He wanted that of the people who apply, only few should apply. And uh, therefore, he introduced a system of complicated cut-off dates, all illegal. First he said everybody can apply. Then he said anyone that he announced in first week of September. Then he announced, no, no, only those who, up, who apply up before October 1, on or before October 1, 2007, they will be considered. After all the applications that come in, and even then 575 applications came in. On 10th of January he gives a statement that I have now decided that only those who applied on or before 25th September 2007 I will consider. That's totally illegal. You have put a cutoff date of 1 1st October 2007. After it is over and two, two and a half, uh, almost three months later, you decide that it is uh, uh, going to be 25th of September. And so the applications get cut down. Then he puts another condition on the 10th of January, which he issues only in, a, in his ministry website, that, and that he, that he issues at 2.45 p.m. on 10th January, in which the press, the press release says, from 3.30 to 4.30 today, whoever brings a demand draft for 16.50 crores will get the license. Now you tell me in India you can't even get one crore demand draft in, in such a short time of 45 minutes. Yet uh, nine companies came with demand drafts. Obviously they had advanced information. Two of those companies were not even telecom companies. They were real estate companies. One was called Swan and the other was called tele, uh, Unitech. And both of them were sitting in Raja's room when their press release was being, was being released. And they already had got the demand drafts. And as soon as the announcement came, they were ushered in by his private secretary and they were given the license. Since they had no experience whatsoever, they didn't have a single tower, they had no equipment. What did they do? They went and sold their licenses to two foreign companies. The rule in the, in the te, uh, Telecom uh, Act is that unless you have worked on the license for three years, you cannot sell. Broken the law. And he so allowed these two companies to sell. They sold it at eight times. The market price was ten times. But they sold it at eight times to two companies. Tata sold it to Docomo 
for 13 times. All these nine companies ended up having got the license at a low price, they sold them at least a part of their shares to foreign companies. But Swan and Telecom, they went to such an extreme that one of them sold it to A.T. Salat, Dubai based company, and the other sold it to Telenor, a Norwegian company which does all its business in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Now, surprisingly, the Home Ministry had an advisory that not in connection with this telecom licensing, but generally, even before the telecom licensing, that Eti Salat and Telenor should not be allowed to do any business in India for national security reasons. Because Eti Salat is, according to Intelligence Bureau, a front for the ISI of Pakistan and its India company, Etisalat DB, its MD called Shahid Balwas, he is an agent or an associate of Dawood Ibrahim. And as far as Telenor is concerned, although it's a Norwegian company, they said they buy the equipment from the Chinese army and the Chinese army's telecom equipment can do both. It can also do cyber warfare. And so if they do business in India, then during a war, a possible war between India and China, these, this equipment can then be used for making all your tele, uh, computers of the Defense Department, Defense Ministry, null and void. So they said this, but it was disregarded. By then Chidambaram had become Home Minister, he should have known. There was some widespread criticism in the country why they were allowed to be sold. So Raja has written a office note which I got a copy of, in which he says that to his, there's a note to his secretaries and the officials. There's so much criticism that I allowed Swan and Unitech to sell off their companies to A.T. Salat and Telenor. But it was Mr. Chidambaram who told me that I can do it and I should do it. Then if Raja is in jail, what is Chidambaram doing outside the jail? <laughs> I said this to the Supreme Court on the 13th of May. That here are the documents which show that Mr. Chidambaram was as much a party to the decisions as Raja is. And if Raja is being prosecuted and is in jail for it, then Chidambaram should go. The court said we want a full hearing on this and they have fixed 24th August because earlier I could not accept the date because I was to teach at Harvard. I teach every, every year in the summer at Harvard University, I teach economics. So I requested the court, the court gave me 24th. I'm reasonably sure that after 24th, Mr. Chidambaram will also be in Tihar jail. There are many more. Raja went first, then Kandimori, soon Dayanidhi Maran, because he forced one of the telecom companies to sell to a Malaysian who has LTT connections. I mean, these people have no patriotism at all. This is what corruption does when you want to just make more money, more money. Look for every shortcut to make money. And if Raja has gone in, some Rani must go in also. <laughs> Even if she. <laughs> Even if she is Italian. They are no more calling Tiyar, Tiyar jail, they are calling it Club Tiyar. <laughs> they are serving masal dosas nowadays. There. Because so many Tamilians are in jail. Soon they will be serving pizzas also. <laughs> so you have today, because of corruption, your economy distorted. 
your development therefore affected. Financing of terrorism is becoming possible. My Then it, it spreads, you see. The, there's a huge influx of people from Bangladesh. The BSF is supposed to stop it. And they are in full strength there. But once the culture of corruption comes, the BSF takes money and lets them in. Now people say, this is communal to point this out. I say, how can it be? After all, when partition was created, the British said there are Muslims who cannot bear to live with Hindus. So they have to get a separate area. And that's how Pakistan was created. But once you create Pakistan, of which now Bangladesh has gone alone, uh, has gone separate, then the same Muslims come back to your country and start living with Hindus, then I think uh, in the proportion in which they have come, we must get the land also back, because after all it's all Indian land. <laughs> I would say that the impact of corruption is an extraordinarily serious dimension now, and we have to fight it now. We are very fortunate that today we have a leadership with the Chief Justice, Justice Kapadia, who has made it known to all judges that you must help in the fight against corruption. It's a pity that the Prime Minister should be taking the lead. But the Prime Minister, you see, he may be personally honest, but he is watching all this. Lord Krishna says in Mahabharat to Arjuna, to in the Gita, when the war is going on and Arjuna hesitates about shooting the arrow on Bhishmacharya, he says he may be a great scholar, he may be a teacher, but he violated the fundamental moral law when he saw Draupadi being stripped and he did nothing about it. So, Mr. Pr Prime Minister, may be personally honest, but that doesn't absolve him. When I first went to, when I first wanted permission, I wrote to the PM, please give me permission to prosecute Raja. No reply. Then I wrote him another letter with more information. No reply. Then I wrote him three more letters, five letters. No reply. So I went to the court and said, this Prime Minister is non-functioning. So <laughs> under the constitution, I have a right to ask the court to give me permission to prosecute Raja. The Prime Minister, the court was very angry. And they issued a notice to the Prime Minister to file an affidavit. In the history of the world, it's the first time the Prime Minister has been asked to file an affidavit in a court. When you ask somebody to file an affidavit on court, then it means that you don't trust his words. So therefore you want it on an affidavit. That means you swear the ceremony and the statement. There was a clamor for, uh, for his resignation. But I saved him by saying, no, he didn't, doesn't have to resign. Because he doesn't know the law. And there is a how he can give sanction when he has to take a sanction from Sonia Gandhi in the first place. <laughs> and what is the use of removing him? Do you think you will get a better person? You will get some buddhu who will be even bigger rubber stamp or maybe even a bigger crook. So there is no point either, you know, if you are in the opposition, you fight to remove the government. You don't fight to remove individuals. So therefore, the Prime Minister can remain as till we reach a situation where the people decide that we need a new government. So the Supreme Court has since then done a number of wonderful things. 
they have said to the CBI, you will not be any more guided by the government on this issue. You will listen only to us. And of course I am there, so I can make petitions. I can tell the court, please do this, please ask them to do this. That the daughter of another very important minister from Maharashtra, she is also in trouble. Well, all of you know. <laughs> so, how many ministers are going to go? I would think there will be seven or eight ministers of the government who will be in jail. <laughs> this is unprecedented for India. Because India and atmosphere had come, nothing will happen. The corrupt people were spreading this. Nothing will happen in India. The laws are not sufficient. They should be made strong. Anna Hazari's contribution, however, is one which I would commend here today. Only one, of, one clause in this entire Jan Lokpal bill is worthy. Otherwise, with the present laws, I'm getting action anyway. I must say that the Supreme Court has selected a judge as a trial court judge. And this trial court judge is as tough as they come. Of course, he, uh, he has a problem because there are so many accused. There are 23 accused already. And all of them are billionaires. And they can afford lawyers, the best quality lawyers. They usually come with five lawyers each. So 23 times five is almost 100 lawyers are breathing down the neck of the judge, you see. And poor chap, but he he's held ground. Those who thought that India is a weak country should see the kinds of, kinds of changes that have come. I myself, people ask me, how did you get all these documents? Well, you'll be surprised how I got these documents. One day at 9.30 in the night, the doorbell rang, I opened it, and there was a well-dressed young, youngish man. He said, uh, my name is uh, Achari, Ashirvadam Achari and I would like to talk to you. So I said, where do you work? He said, I'm private secretary to the, to the Minister of Telecom, Mr. Raja. Oh. So I said, aren't you doing a very dangerous thing by coming to me? He said, no, I've come because my conscience has pricked me. And so I invited him in and he told me all that had happened. And he provided the documents to me. And later on, he appeared before the magistrate and recorded a statement. But for him, this case would have come this far. Now, I never knew that such people exist. And he is not a, just an ordinary stenographer, I think. He is a private secretary. He is an official rank. Private assistant is a stenographer. But private secretary to minister is an IAS officer. And here he staked his entire career and came to me and told me the whole thing and then the CBI was informed and then they took, uh, took, took charge and he laid the foundation for the prosecution in this matter. Then there's a journalist who's extremely poor. I mean, it means he's not, uh, he's not starving, but he works for the pioneer called J. Gopal uh, Gopi Krishna. He was a relentless research that came in the paper day after day, despite all the threats he received. He continued. So there are people like that. There are judges like Justice Singhvi and Justice Ganguly who are not afraid of anybody. And as a consequence today, I can say that if this 2G spectrum scandal goes to its logical conclusion, We'll have a new dawn in India. India was not a... <laughs> India was not a, uh, a corrupt country 400, 500 years ago. There are reports of foreigners who came to India, like Vasco da Gama, Farsian from China, Mark Twain from America. They all, one thing they all say, Indians are very honest people.
They don't even lock their houses when they go out. What has happened? The process of corruption started with Jawaharlal Nehru's wrong choice of policy of adopting the Russian Soviet Union's economic model, which meant government control of everything, licenses and quotas. Soon the licenses and quotas began to be sold in the black market. Soon emerged a bunch of touts and they they then became rich, but they ensured that the industrialists in the private sector got the licenses. That's how corruption started after 1947. In 1991, I was a minister at that time, commerce minister. I prepared the blueprints for economic reforms. Manmohan Singh, before I became minister, was in Geneva. He was in some UN commission. He had left the country. I phoned him up and asked him to return. And he came and became our government's economic advisor. Montek Singh was my commerce secretary. The three of us sat together and prepared the blueprints. But then the Chandrasekhar government fell and Mr. Narsimha Rao came. And Mr. Narsimha Rao, in my opinion, deserves the full credit for the political sagacity in implementing the economic reform. I prepared the blueprints, Narsimha Rao implemented, but the credit went to, Narsimha, uh, to Manmohan Singh. As finance minister, he brought all these reforms, but as prime minister, he can't bring anything. That cannot be. The nation needs to correct it. Sonia Gandhi never liked Narsimha Rao because when he became Prime Minister, he had had three severe heart attacks. And he looked like a man who was about to die. He was made Prime Minister probably with Sonia Gandhi's expectation that he will die in six months. But after he became Prime Minister, health started improving. <laughs> and he lasted full five years. He was defeated in the election despite bringing a major economic change in our country from less than 3% growth rate to almost 8% growth rate. And he died a completely discredited person by his own party. Some future government will have to rectify that. But people say that because of these economic reforms there is more corruption today. Not because of economic reforms, because the economy is booming. And if the economy is booming, the, the, if you go by percentage terms and look at it in absolute terms, of course, the numbers are going to be large. Telecom has grown out of zero to something huge today. And so therefore, a, a cut on that is bound to be huge. You have uh, 1,76,000 crores lost, of that 60,000 was distributed as, as, as bribe, Raja got only 3,000 crores, only 3,000 crores, <laughs> Chidamam got 5,000, Karunanidhi got 18,000, 16,000 16, crores, and after all, you know, he's got three wives, so he has to have a little. <laughs> And Sonia Gandhi got 36,000 crores. Raja once told me in Parliament House we met, say, why are you troubling me like this? I have settled with everybody. Nothing will happen. <laughs> I'd like to see him now. One day maybe I'll go and visit him in jail and say, what has happened? <laughs> but this is the way corruption has been functioning. Everybody has been looked after. Opposition leaders have been looked after. They won't raise any questions. Nobody went to court. I went to court. There are so many lawyers in the opposition. They only do walk out, giving statements, because there is an understanding. And that understanding continues whether the opposition is in power, comes to power, or that. That we have to change. 
Now, therefore, I would ask a question. Now, first of all, let me say that on the 2G thing, I will not let go because I have sunk my teeth into it. I filed a new, another petition and argued before coming and orders have been reserved to cancel all the licenses and auction them afresh. <laughs> orders have been reserved and any day the judgment will come. If that happens, it will be a big thing. On money trail, the Supreme Court has got so angry. You explain to me, why should they get angry? Germany found that some of his officials are putting money illegally in Liechtenstein Bank. And they decided that this is unacceptable. So what they did is that German intelligence bribed a senior official of the Liechtenstein Bank to give a CD of all the illegal bank accounts or numbered accounts as they are called, not illegal, they are called numbered accounts. <coughs> of all the number accounts with their names for a payment of only $5 million. So that official gave it. Germany then separated them by countries. And they found that uh, these large number of names had, were from 42 countries in a small place like Liechtenstein. Imagine what it must be like in Switzerland. And India had 16 names. So they wrote to all the governments, we've got your nationals, uh, records of your nationals who have got illegal bank accounts in Liechtenstein. If you want, we'll send it to you. 41 countries immediately wrote, please send it back, send it, send it to us. But India was the only country which didn't reply. <laughs> then some of us created a halagula. So Prime Minister wrote a letter. Now that names have come. They wouldn't make it public. So some people went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, give us the list. They said, no, we'll not give you the list. Or I'll conduct an inquiry. Who got how much? Won't do that. So in disgust, the Supreme Court said, all right, then we are setting up an inquiry committee special in investigation team, SIT, under the chairmanship of a retired but very honest judge called Jeevan Reddy. And they will investigate. Now the court is saying, the government, government is filing a new petition, review petition, saying, no, 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 you are usurping our powers. The Constitution has said very clearly, Ambedkar in his speech in the Constituent Assembly has said, when the government fails to do its duty, that time the courts have a right to intervene and substitute for the government. <laughs> and that's what happened for sanction also. I asked for sanction. Prime Minister didn't reply. Went to court. Court gave me sanction. So therefore, they are now filing a review petition because they are so scared of the names coming out. Then there was one man who was a scrap collector. Well, in this country, he may be called garbage collector. But in India, we have a more respectable term, scrap collector. <laughs> called Hassan Ali. And he had an account of 81 billion dollars. 81 billion dollars. Excuse me, not it. 8.1 billion dollars, right. 8.1 billion dollars. Now, how could a scrap collector have an account of $8 million? This was, nobody, this is an ordinary income tax officer found out by a raid in uh, Hassan Ali's house. And then he informed the finance ministry. Finance ministry officials informed Mr. Chidambaram. Mr. Chidambaram's greed was uh, stoked. So he sent, uh, sent word to Hassan Ali, you share 50-50 and I'll let you go. <laughs> Hassan Ali couldn't share for reasons I'll explain in a minute. So Chidambaram thought this man is misbehaving. So he wrote a letter to this to Swiss authorities, 
we in our income tax rate have found such and such Swiss bank accounts in such and such bank of bank number so and so. Kindly confirm it and send us the documents. So Switzerland sent it to their courts and the courts gave direction, give them the documents and those documents were given. Meantime, Chidambaram was shifted to Home Ministry. Maybe because of this, they say it was 2611, I don't know. And Pranam Mukherjee came in as Finance Minister. The first letter he wrote to the Swiss, Swiss government is, my predecessor wrote a letter in which he gave the uh, uh, bank accounts and their numbers. Unfortunately, there was an error in the numbers given. So I'm supplying you fresh numbers of the bank accounts. They're all bogus numbers. So Switzerland immediately said, oh, these are, no such accounts exist. And they defrost this man's account. Within three days, that $8.1 billion was cleared out. But Mr. Hassan Ali was in custody. How did he clear out? This means that Hassan Ali opened the account, but the password was worth somebody else. So this is a new technique. Open an account in somebody else's name and the password will be with somebody else. Now at this time recently they found that number of uh, accounts were given to us by Switzerland and there were Shailesh Gandhi, Praveen Gandhi, all, all Gandhis. <laughs> and all of them were, when the press correspondents went to these Gandhis, they were all very ordinary people. They could not have an account in Switzerland. And they also didn't, they were shocked. How come our name came? So obviously some Gandhi has got the password and put it all in these names. Of course there are other difficulties. Sonia Gandhi's sisters are still Italians, citizens. Sonia Gandhi herself is, but I have not yet got the records. If you are NRI want to do, want to know what you can do to help the fight against corruption, please go to Italy and get those records. Or, or, or employ a private detective to go to Italy. You have the, you have the resources, you have got the capacity and you have got the reach. We in India who are fighting corruption would like only information. The Americans have a lot of information. But they are not sharing. The American Fort Meade, you see, near uh, Washington, that has a computer which records every bank transaction in India, in the world. And they have buzzwords. So, supposing it says something, uh, says Osama bin Laden, immediately it will give you a printout. So, all the data is there with the Americans, but the Americans, why should they cooperate with you? The Americans are not going to cooperate on merit. It has to be a give and take. They think that the Indians are not serious. And they are not serious. They can't be serious. Because all of them have accounts. If I had an account by now, they would have sent me to jail. But I don't have. That's why only fakirs can fight India, uh, fight uh, corruption in India. That's why we need Ramdev, we need uh, Anna Azari, just such types of people who the whole world knows don't have anything. They may try anything, but nothing gets stuck. Nothing can be pinned on them. So I am saying that this amount of money, how much is it abroad? Some say half a trillion dollars, some say one and a half trillion dollars. But one of my Harvard students became a chairman of one of the Swiss banks and he told me, but for Indians, our bank would have financially collapsed long time ago. <laughs> I said, why? Because they bring so many accounts. He said, no, no, no. They come, they are so insecure, they don't even leave a beneficiary name and they die and the money becomes ours. <laughs> That's how it's been. So in this situation, we can correct corruption at all levels. There was a time there was so much corruption in railway reservations. Once the railway reservations became computerized, all corruption in that is gone. 
It used to be a great harassment. Every ticket conductor had to be cajoled, given money to give you a reservation or the ticket clerk at the counter. But today there's none of that. In fact, you can get on your mobile with your, now, what is your waiting time and when will it be confirmed or if it is confirmed, you'll get a uh, SMS alert. So, that has happened. There are areas which were used to be corrupt in India are now clean. Now the real place where corruption has been cleaned is at this top level. The other things will automatically get cleaned up, by example. You see, one of the things is, in the short run to cure from corruption, you can have laws, but they must be enforced. On 7th January 2007, 2008, there were two press conferences which came one after the other. One was a press conference in Hyderabad addressed by Ramalinga Raju of Satyam. He said, I have done fraud in my accounts and I have salted away 7,500 crores. I am ready to face any punishment. And I hereby resign from the chairmanship of Satyam. That's a confession. Around the same time in New York, a gentleman by the name Bernard Medoff held a press conference saying that I have sinned because I have defalcated pension funds in Ponzi schemes. I am ready to face any punishment. I am ready to accept any punishment as an atonement. Within six months, Bernard Medoff was in convicted in prison for 150 years. Six months. But uh, Ramalinga Raju is still lying in the air-conditioned room of Apollo Hospital in Hyderabad. No charge sheet yet. This is one of the things that we need to correct. Anna Hazare is right in saying that country needs a change in law the one thing that I accept in what he says is correct. We need an independent public prosecutor. Hong Kong was the most corrupt country of East of Asia. Once that independent public prosecutor was appointed, within 10 years Hong Kong has become the cleanest country now in the Transparency International right at the top. Here also, when President Clinton on that Monica Lewinsky case, America appoints an independent prosecutor on an ad hoc basis. Watergate, they appointed a uh, public prosecutor, independent public prosecutor. India too, we can have, and I'm testing the law already, even without Anna Zare's proposed amendment. He is proposing a general amendment, but I'm saying in corruption law, <coughs> we can have an independent public prosecutor because I had gone to court saying, asking the court, that is the trial court, not the Supreme Court, the trial court, please appoint me as an independent public prosecutor. So the court said, how can we? The CRPC says that only government lawyers can be appointed public prosecutors. So I said, yes, that is in the CRPC. But the Prevention of Corruption Act, that says that you can appoint an independent public prosecutor. He said, read it out to me. So I read section 5. It says that the person who files the private complaint in cor on corrupt under the Prevention of Corruption Act can be appointed as an independent public prosecutor under the law. And the judge tells me, I never knew this law existed. <laughs> but I don't blame him because nobody had brought it to any his attention. And most people don't know the law. The law is now, I think, it now has become, the most, society has become so complex. I think our uh, educational system should now start teaching law as a required subject. So that everybody knows some law and they're not terrified by law. In the short run, yes, we need uh, to, uh, we need to tighten the laws particularly this independent public prosecutor, and one or two people go to jail, it has a very salutary effect.
but long run it's not so simple because people will then start finding other ways of being corrupt and that we must understand the root of corruption then it's my last thing that i want to say to you what is the root of corruption it's greed to make more money why you want to make more money because that's what gives you social status of course it affords you a lot of amenities but that you know you don't need all that money but this money for more and more money to throw around money that's a search for social status our society hindu society what is called as sanatana dharma has understood this from the very beginning when two great rishis met to discuss how to structure society one was rishi brigu and the other was rishi bhardwaj they met to discuss how to structure society so stable so rishi brigu said there are four sources of power in a society and we must ensure that nobody has more than one of that what are the four sources knowledge weapons second wealth third land fourth these should not be in one hand not even two should be in one hand so those who have knowledge will not have weapons will not have wealth will not have land and they will be venerated the most those who have weapons will rule the country but they cannot make policy they can't decide when to go to war they cannot give uh, punishment under the law for criminals in other countries of europe where the kings were there they were doing they, they were the authority for declaring war authority for giving punishment so that was monarchy ours was not a monarchy because they had to go to the people with the knowledge to seek their permission seek their advice those who had wealth were certainly you know they had a right to make wealth but their social status will depend on how much philanthropy they do and those who had land would have to produce for the society those who were pushed out of society there were very few those days it all happened after these invasions that these numbers grew their children will not be pushed out in fact none of these four categories of varna brahmin kshatriya vaishya and sudra none of them was by birth if at all like the rishi atre said everyone is born a shudra but afterwards when he selects his vocation in life he becomes a dvija and then he goes to one of these castes Veda Vyasa, who is a Maharishi who wrote the Ramayana, Mahabharat, his mother was a fisher woman. Valmiki was is considered to be children, a child of the Dalits. He wrote the Ramayana. He became Maharishi. Uh, Kalidasa was the greatest poet we produced, and he was a hunter. Vishwamitra, the Rishi of Rishis, he was born in a Kshatriya family. where is this brahmin supremacy that people talk about the knowledge supremacy. and yes brahmin there was a famous brahmin and he was ravan ravan was a brahmin most people don't know that karnalidhi never knew that and used to worship ravan he used to celebrate ravan leela because rama was from north therefore he must be a brahmin i said no no rama is a kshatriya no i can't be i said ravan is a brahmin he was in fact he went to mansarovar in fact i had urged the chinese to reopen mansarovar because my influence with the personal friendship with the topmost leader tang xiaoping he agreed and i was the first pilgrim to go after 35 years so on the way to mansarovar 
I saw a very big lake on the head. I thought that is Mansovar. So I told my guide, Tibetan guides, that Mansovar has come. They said, no, no, this is called Ravan Haranga. So I said, Ravan Haranga, what does that mean? They said, Haranga means uh, Sarovar, that is lake. But Ravan we don't know, some Indian, some Indian name. So I said, oh really, let me also collect a sample of this water. They said, no, no, don't touch this water. If you drink it, you will have, will be poisoned. You may even die. So an evil thought crossed my mind. I filled a bottle of that water and brought it and gave it to Karuna Nidhi and said, please drink it. <laughs> he did tabasya. Ravan did tabasya there. That's why Shiva Bhagavan was available to him whenever he wanted. But he broke the law. So Kshatriya killed him. The Brahmins of, the, of India do not worship Ravan because and say that this Rama, terrible fellow, he's killed one of our Brahmins. He doesn't say that. Because he got nothing to do with birth. But he's got connected with birth now. And that's why he's creating problems. Because Karnanidhi no more talks about Ravan anymore. He only talks about Rama. <laughs> Once when I was arguing the matter on Ram Setu in the Supreme Court, I said, Ram Setu. And he heard about it from the newspaper. He said, what is this Supramanian Swami saying, Ram Setu? Who's Rama? Is he an engineer? Which engineering college he got a degree from? <laughs> Next day he fell ill. So he was admitted to a hospital by the name Ramchandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> it's a famous hospital in I sent him a letter saying, get well soon. At least Rama has got an MBBS, you can be satisfied. <laughs> this is the kind of distortion that has gone into the minds of the people. We, this Sanatana Dharma has stood you ground because we separated these powers and we downgraded the status of money. Make money, no problem. But don't be greedy about it. Nothing is going to depend. Your society, your social status is not going to depend on it. If at all it depends, it's how much of philanthropy you do. And that's what has kept you stable all this time. You see, we have 800 years of Islamic rule, 200 years of Christian rule through the British. What about other countries? which had this kind of conquest. Iran was a Zoroastrian country, what we call as Parsis today in India. The Islam, Islam conquered Iran. Within 15 years, they made them 100% Muslim. Muslims conquered Babylon and Mesopotamia, which is now called Iraq. Within 21 years, they made them 100% Muslim. In 17 years, they made Egypt 100% Muslim. Christians made Europe within 50 years 100% Christian. But here, 800 years of Muslim rule, 200 years of Christian rule, and you're still 80%. 80% Hindu. That means the Hindu must have fought. <laughs> Maybe our war techniques were not uh, proper for these barbarians who came because we had rule you cannot fight till the sun rises and you cannot continue the fighting after the sun sets you have to go back to your tambu and have a night's sleep you cannot fight in the agricultural field you cannot fight in the in the cities in population centers you have to fight in open maidan like kurukshetra or even raman had to come out as is fought and fight Rama in the open Maidan. And once you lose and you say, I'm sorry, you return back everything and say, Chalo, why, Vapis Jao. <laughs> and Prithira Chavan sent back uh, Mohammed Ghori 16 times that way. Forgave him and sent him back. 17th time he came, he had the support of Prithira Chavan's father in law, Jaichan. And that's how Islam was established. But the fighting never stopped. Whether it's the Vijayanagam Empire, which was founded in the south to drive out the Islamic invaders, it lasted 300 years, the Vijayanagam Empire. 
and covered more areas than the Mughal Empire did. Right up to Assam they went. But in the history books, Akbar to uh, Aurangzeb is only 150 years. But one one chapter for each Badsha. <laughs> but Vijayanagar Empire, one paragraph. There was a, in South India, there was an empire called Vijayanagar Empire. There was Rani Chennamma in Karnataka who valiantly fought against the, the Islamic rule. Kattabaman in Tamil Nadu fought against the British and was hanged. What about Rana Pratap? He ate Ghaski Roti, but he said, I will not submit. Rani Jhansi. Fighting continued throughout. Shivaji, of course, I cannot forget. So India has this tradition of having fought. But our history books and our young people are all taught to say, no, no, we have beaten. And the English said, we are also one more invasion. We have had so many invasions, uh, we are also one more invasion. This is the mind that is being controlled. And today, in the name of globalization, we are becoming materialistic and materialistic. And we are forgetting Sanat and Dharma. Those who have achieved prosperity, they are thinking about us, our uh, Sanat and Dharma. There is this very famous, rich Hollywood actress called Julia Roberts. She went to Ariana to do a shooting. And then she asked uh, her uh, crew people, what is this? All people seem to be, there's so much calmness in their face, despite all the poverty. What's the reason? So they took her to some Swamiji. And he explained to them about Gita and how people accept what is, what they are, what they have freedom to do and what is inevitable, what's not in their hands, etc. She was so impressed that she came back, she became a Hindu and made her whole family Hindu. I'm sure you would have seen in the papers that this Hollywood actress has become a Hindu with her entire family. You go to any of these ashrams of Sri Sri Ram Shankar, Swami Dayanand, Saraswati, Swami Ram Dev, they are full of foreigners, rich foreigners from foreign countries. Or Sai Baba when he was on this earth. Why is it that after achieving so much prosperity they are not happy? Because happiness how to achieve that happiness is there in Sanat Dharma that if you pursue material goals in harmony with your spiritual values, you shall be happy, otherwise you shall not be happy. This is what Sanat Dharma teaches. <laughs> so long run, there is a need for a course correction. I am not saying that you should all become sadhus and wear Bhagavad Kupra, no. I am saying pursue it. But don't extol the accumulation of money as an end in itself. I was very deeply disappointed when I went to the IIM to give a lecture and asked all the students, <coughs> why are you here? Why did you enroll in this IIM? <coughs> Almost without exception, they said, because our after degree prospect of employment with the highest pay is in IIM. You have no love for the subject. He said, no, we have no love for the subject. <laughs> we are here because we want a good career. Twenty years, thirty years ago, everybody was going to engineering. A little before that, they were going to write IAS and ICS exams. <coughs> so our mind has been made up like that. We cannot be a strong nation just because there are a billion people. You have thousand goats and one tiger. The goats have the majority, but it is after seeing the tiger, they will run. Not the tiger will not run. In fact, the tiger will chase them. Strength also is not enough. If you go to a circus and you see this cage, one thin ringmaster, five lions, each very strong, well-fed, each of them can kill that uh, ringmaster. But they obey him and he says, get up. Go on, climb up the table. They all climb up the table. This is called the mindset. We have today, our mind is being set not by us, not by our Sanskriti, but by the Westerner view of what we should doing when they themselves have failed. They themselves are coming, searching from us 
how to do yoga, how to do this, how to do that. Even in Harvard when I'm teaching, I get harassed by phone calls because they see my name Swami, so they think I must be some sadhu. I get telephone calls asking me to come and give pravachan and all that, you see. So, why is that? Anyway, let us learn from this world trend. It's not going to produce happiness. So corruption will definitely go once the value the, the status value of money goes down. That's the long run solution. You have to bring it back. I'm very happy that you have a Hindu Mahasabha association here. There's nothing wrong with being called Hindu. We are Hindus. We are all one Hindus because our DNA is the same. I've told many people that I challenge anybody to show me that the Indians are different. But when Raj Thakre was making the statement that all these UP Taxi wallas must leave Bombay because they are not Marathis. I, I clandestinely got a sample of his hair. And I got one taxi driver's uh, sample of his hair also. And I got it tested for DNA and found the DNA is the same for both. So I announced that Thakre has also come from UP. Who is he to talk about UP taxi wala? We are one people. When I came as a student to Harvard originally in the early 60s to do my PhD, my classmate, an American, asked me, how can you accept Mahatma Gandhi as your leader? So I said, why? In America you will not accept him. He said, America will put him in jail for indecent exposure. <laughs> I said, what do, you, what do you mean by that? He said, our leaders have to be well dressed, they must have a nice tie, must have a nice suit. We will not accept somebody who is just putting one piece of cloth and moving around. That made me think. How is it that millions and millions of people don't raise this question? They are all following Gandhi. All followed Gandhi. That is the Hindu ethos. They are ultimately sacrifice, giving up, is raised to the highest status. Why is Ramdev so acceptable? Why is Anna Zare with this simple Gandhi topi acceptable? Why was Gandhi your leader? Why was JP your leader? Not because they were smartly dressed and went around in Cadillacs, because they were simple people. That is the ultimate value. And that value. <laughs> that is the value we must bring back. Then long run corruption. Can we all, all this 2G, everything, we'll take care, no problem. There are many more coming, by the way. It's not really the start. I don't know where we'll keep them. Maybe we'll have to outsource our jails to America. <laughs> but uh, in the long run, we must be self-sustaining in fighting corruption. And that can only come by not a new culture, but our old culture with the amendment that for for a long time to come, we must forget these caste distinctions. We must unite as Hindus. I have no difficulty. <laughs> I have no difficulty accepting any Muslim or Christian also as part of the family, provided they acknowledge what is the truth, what the DNA says, that their ancestors are also Hindus. And therefore, they respect the culture of India because their ancestors were Hindus. Yeah. Yeah. They say that they are part of my family. If they say they are descendants of Gauri and Ghazni, then the proper place for them is Pakistan, not India. Yeah. This, uni this identity of India has to be firmly planted. Because we are going to have big challenges coming. Pakistan is crumbling, the Taliban will take it over, you are going to have a war. You have homegrown terrorists in India now. For the first time, after this Bombay blast, we can say that we have finally got homegrown terrorists. Homegrown means they are financed by Pakistan, definitely. But they are not Pakistanis, like Kazab, Kazab was. Is. And therefore, you are going to have major problem for which we need unity. And that unity 
we need a government which comes on the power of that unity. Today the governments are coming on the power of division of our country. Separate the Muslims, separate the Christians, you know, break them into Yadavas, Hindus into Yadavas and, and scheduled caste and so on. This fragmentation of the Hindu community is the source of today's government formation. We must change that and say the Hindu unity should be the source of government formation. There will be a revolution in India in expectations overnight. All of you should resolve this. There's nothing you need to do in India. We've got enough people in India. But we certainly would welcome information. Lots of politicians visit here. Lots of information is available. Rahul Gandhi was studying in Florida in a place called Winter Park, Rollins College. How did he pay his tuition fees? From an account in Cayman Island. Illegal account. If some of you have influence in that college, you should get the transcripts. Once I did that with Sonia Gandhi, you know, she claimed that she was educated in the University of Cambridge and got a degree in English. It was an affidavit. It's a sworn affidavit. I had gone by chance to give a lecture in University of Cambridge, I asked the people there, they said, no, no, no such student. <laughs> so I said, will you give it to me in writing? They said, yes. They gave me in writing. As per your query, we want to inform that name by the name of Antonia Mino, or she has many names. Antonia Mino, Sonia Gandhi, uh, Edwige, Albino, Mino, etc., etc. So they gave me that letter, I gave it to the speaker of the Lok Sabha and said, you see, she has claimed that she has got this degree, please, this is wrong. She should be asked an explanation. The speaker sent it to her. And she replied back saying it was a typing mistake. <laughs> How can it be a typing mistake? Typing mistake can be a comma, full stop. <laughs> but a whole sentence is a typing mistake. <laughs> then, she should say, then she should send it to the Guinness Book of World Record for the longest typing mistake. <laughs> Now these people, they have fib a lot. We can't know. Now that's important because she said that she was in England studying. She was five years in England between 1963 and 68 before marrying Rajiv Gandhi. If she was not studying, what was she doing? Well, I know, but I'm not going to tell you today. <laughs> You'll read my website, janataparty.org, it's all there. So, I'm saying that, you know, th these people today are supporting corruption. They're supporting Hassan Ali, they're refusing the Supreme Court, they're blocking uh, on the 2G as much as they can. So they are actually not helping us at all. And they've reduced the Prime Minister's chair into a joke. So we have to have everything we know about them. That's something you can do sitting here. But this country is today, we are in a position to get through the RTI, the Freedom of Information Act, and so many other things. A share access movement and so on, you can get a lot of information. This is what we need to know, and certainly I'll be communicating with you in the future. But the most important thing is to develop a positive mindset, to become a strong I mean, I would say Hindustani, if, I, if it means that Hindustani would mean a Hindu plus all others, those who acknowledge that their ancestors are Hindus, that combination would be, that grouping would be called Hindustani. We must be one, rising above all our differences, because the hour of challenge is very near. You're going to have a war from the Taliban-based controlled Pakistan. And we have to be ready to have the final war with Pakistan. And for that we have to prepare our mindset as a fighting public, as a public which is not bothered about small things, but a public which is ready to make the necessary sacrifice. That is the long run solution, otherwise corruption will make us lose what our Jawans have been periodically winning on the battlefield. We will lose because our leaders will make the sacrifice of the national interest because of corrupt reasons. This is what I want to say.
Thank you very much. I'd like you to know something about uh, Hindu Mahasabha and it's a very fascinating organization, has a lot of nice professionals and believe it or not, I think it should be clear by now that there is such a thing as a Hindu political interest that needs defending and we are committed to that over there and we really want many of you to come and join us if you can uh, and contribute your talent and your time because there is a lot of work to be done and uh, we are all eager to do it and we need your help. Uh, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Darminder Dagar. Uh, he's a very fascinating man. Uh, we are in a program to help our Hindu young men rise to their maximum potential and that we uh, do it through a program called mentorship and Dharminder is heads that program. So I would like you to, uh, like him, to tell you what he does in addition to other wonderful things he does. So Dharminder, thank you. Namaskar. And uh, Dr. Swami, uh, he has done a wonderful job. I think this was one of the, a moving speech. So I would uh, request everybody to give him another a rousing applause. I just like to add a couple of things when uh, Dr. Swami talked about simplicity and having the knowledge. Dr. Swami, he is a Harvard professor. He teaches over there. But yesterday when I was picking him up at the airport, I was expecting at least a couple of bags. He's traveling, coming from India. I was so surprised when he showed up, you know, other colleague members, Sri Ramji, were there when we received him, and there was one back. And I was asking, I said, have you left something, or the bags have not arrived? So the simplicity of Dr. Swami was that he has a couple of clothes, pair of clothes, and I asked him, I said, sir, that, that's what you have? He said, yeah, I don't need anything else. So, he not only goes, you know, talks about his uh, passion and what he believes in, I think he is a practical man in that terms. So, I salute him for that. <laughs> Come back to, uh, just want to put a plug for Hindu Mahasabha as well. Hindu Mahasabha, we are politically active committees. We believe in Hindu values, we believe in Hindu cause, we believe in something that as a community, as we identify ourselves as Hindus, we need to break the barrier that we are in one sampradaya or another sampradaya, we follow this particular tradition or that particular tradition. If we have a common value, we should all work together. And Hindu Mahasabha, in different form, is taken different roles, and this is one of the prime example of inviting Dr. Swami and talking about the corruption which is happening in India. I'd like to play, uh, give some more information about our next event, Hindu Memorial Day. This is the second year we would be uh, holding this event, and Dr. Talukdar has already talked about it, so I'll just give some more details. This event is going to be in India House on 13th of August, although 14th of August is the actual Memorial Day where we observe, I don't say we celebrate, because they, that's the day when India was partitioned again and we lost so many brothers, Hindu brothers and sisters in that. This is not a, a event where we say that we are radicalizing anybody or this is a radical, this is 
to make sure our younger generation, our current generation is aware of that what Hindus have gone through and what we, are, what we should be prepared to do so that this does not happen again. In the same event, we would be having essay competition which have been, which we give some monies to our students so that they participate in the essay and they get, get to it. And I talk about, I want to talk about the mentorship. A mentorship program, this would be, would be launching. We already did one mentorship sessions in the Hindu Sports Day, which we did two months ago. And now we will be doing a separate, a dedicated session just to, for the Hindu students or Hindustani students as well. Our focus is going to be that our Hindu students get to know each other. They start to network with a lot of people. They should not be ashamed. There should not be any barrier saying that I am Hindu and they should not be able to connect. Right now, in our society where we live, in American society, we try to mingle. But if we do mingle, that's fine. But we need to understand that we do have people who have common values and we should network with them. There are a lot of people in our society, in our community, in Houston, who have done tremendous jobs. They are, they are established, very well distinguished professionally. We want to take advantage. We want to leverage their expertise and make sure that a high school student or a middle school student who comes over there and want to get an advice, where does they go and find the right career? If they are trying to seek a career and they try a advice, where should they go? There is no community, there is no forum over here right now in our community where this thing happens. We do meet in temples, we do meet, our, we do our pujas, but after that, we just stop at that point. This would be a forum where we would allow all our young students to network, go into a professional program, professionally run, managed program, so that they can go from one step to another step. And in this one, I like to request everybody who is over here to support Hindu Mahasabha in not only their financial donations, if they can, but get attached volunteer, volunteer their time, volunteer their efforts. Everybody over here has a lot of efforts and you are here for a reason. And if, if one thing I take in last couple of day, days after, after looking at Dr. Swami, reading through his work, is that he's so fearless. He believes he takes action and he actually is a practical person. We, if, if for me, this was a learning experience. When I talk to him, I see him that the, the infusion, the imbibe, the values which we imbibe is that the fearlessness. And that's what I want to bring it to our young generation, that they should be fearless, they should be well connected, and they should respect the Hindu values and preserve it for next generation. And I, at this time, I request everybody who is over here to support Hindu Mahasabha in whatever ways you, you can and help us do these programs again and again. Thank you so much. So, here goes. This was a very common question, so this comes first. What are the ways, Dr. Swami, that NRIs can do to make India corruption free? Uh, Mrs. Gandhi, well, first of all, the Intelligence Bureau told her that she'll win the election and uh, she didn't think she would lose. The second thing she said is that there was so much that the NRIs had created this atmosphere about the lack of elections that Jimmy Carter, who had become president here, made it a point of issue with her. And she thought, anyway, I'm winning the election, so let me also remove this propaganda against me that I'm running a dictatorship. So, I mean, that is the extent to which NRIs played a role at that time. That is a special situation. Today, you certainly can continue with this demonstration. As I say, you should create an information bank. And that information should be collected. There are many interesting ways of doing it. And you can also raise issues 
in, uh, with the Indian newspapers through certain newspaper channels that are here, based here. For instance, if you can get hold of the PTI man, PTI releases something of what you say or what you do or something in your rally or uh, what uh, Baba Ramdev says in a, in, a, in a rally here. Then it will go to all newspapers, particularly the language papers, because PTI is picked up by language papers in all parts of India. You will get all India coverage. So it's an information dissemination that you can do. Uh, I don't think anything else is required uh, from you. You're doing enough, you're already very busy people, but if this much you do, I think you've done quite a lot. Another question was that if the Supreme Court has injunctions against ruling party members, how will it enforce its decision since it has to depend on the government to enforce the decisions? <laughs> well, if, they, if, in the, uh, if the Supreme Court decides something and the government of India says we won't implement it, then I'm telling you it will be an international crisis, it won't be a national crisis. It will mean a signal that you don't believe in democracy. And I don't see the possibility of this government daring to do that. People will then come out on the streets. That is the mood today in the country. And I think both Ramdev's rallies as well as Anna Zare's fast have demonstrated that now people are ready to come on short notice. Thanks to the internet, they get informed easily and therefore I don't think any government would dare. The only thing that we have to prevent is to make sure that some of the uh, people of the government don't run away from the country. We have to chase them and catch them. Check, one, two. Next question. Uh, this was by Sri Surya Kaburi. He's, he wrote his name so I can read it out. Other people didn't write their names. Uh, there is no Lokpal in the Western world. How are they differently structured from India that they are better able to manage a conflict of interest and have successful checks and balances? Well, they, they don't have a Lokpal, uh, but they can, under the Constitution, appoint an independent prosecutor. They did it in the case of Nixon. They did it in the case of um, uh, the Monica Lewinsky case. So, other things in the Lokpal are nothing very special. I mean, even nothing else is accepted, there's no problem. And uh, the present laws are sufficient in India to get prosecution, provided this extra thing of an independent public prosecutor is also accepted. So, in that sense, we will then be on the same. What the happens in the United States, you have to appreciate, is they do get convictions fast on matters where there is no dispute. Like somebody confesses, then there should be no dispute at all. And then they get conviction quickly and they throw the book at that person. In America, if you get caught, then they are brutal. Martha Stewart's uh, offense was very small, but they put her, uh, I think, for 14 days in jail. I asked an American, uh, why are you doing this? He says, because we have to make, huh? 14 months. Wow. So, and you know, what is it? There was some, uh, it, there is an indirect case of in, inside the training, but it was not, uh, I mean, in, in, the, in the Indian framework I was in, I couldn't believe that you would be sent for such a long period. So, that is the MA, the skilling of Enron. And Enron is, I think, in a Houston company, no? Uh, now, he was put in handcuffs. And he was the, what, the elite of the elite? Harvard Business School product, elite of the elite? They don't care. So, consequently, I think uh, you can be sure that the only way we are different from the Americans is that the Americans, when they get enough evidence, they then ensure a conviction quickly. And that's 
what we are going to see for the first time, I think, in 2G. Uh, although it's not, we are not dealing with one person anymore, there are so many accused, but certainly I think by the end of this year, Raja will be convicted and probably in jail for 21 years. Because others will follow suit, huh? not only Raja. That is the best news I've heard in so many years. Next question is, is it realistic to hope that there will be a positive and constructive change in Indian government in the near future? I think you've partly answered that, but go ahead and if you want to expand. Well, there has to be an election, and the election is no later than 2014 for parliament, but I'm expecting an election at the end of this month. Because uh, so many people going to jail and this government continues, <laughs> not possible. So there will be a midterm poll at that time. I hope uh, all the Hindus will join together and vote as Hindus. And not all 80 percent is necessary. 40 percent is enough, we will get two-thirds majority. Okay. And with that two-thirds majority, <laughs> we can do it. And if, if organizations which have got a reach, All India reach, like RSS, Vishwanda Parishad, Amma, Ramdev, uh, Anna Zare, some of us, all come together, then I can tell you that there will be a tsunami in voting, just as you saw in Tamil Nadu today, uh, recently. Completely wiped out DMK. Even though DMK gave so much money, they took the money and voted against DMK. <laughs> Yes, but they brought in Jayalalitha. Huh? They brought in Jayalalitha again. Well, we, if we had a better alternative, we would have uh, got that person. The unfortunate BJP didn't agree with me. I told them one year ago that, you know, one year later the elections are scheduled. Let's set up candidates for all campaigning and do campaigning from now on itself, not during the election. But uh, they were at that time searching for alliances with this party, that party. And, Last minute they told me, yes, we are ready, but it was too late to do anything. For next election, we'll take care of Jalalita also, don't worry. <laughs> As a follow-up question, uh, still Raja Kanemoli enjoy the privileges in jail as a Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha members. Why should their memberships of, as MPs not be dis automatically disqualified? They are in jail on custody basis. They have not been convicted yet. And unless they are convicted, they cannot lose their membership. Even this being in custody basis, being denied bail is itself a very big, very big slur on them because it means prima facie the case against you is so, so strong. But once they are convicted, they will lose their membership. What is the point in their having membership anyway? Uh, they are in uh, jail. They are, they are uh, sh four, four prisoners are sharing one bathroom. <laughs> they, they have no protection against mosquitoes. And it's uh, hot as hell in, uh, in uh, this summer. In, uh, they, they are people who have lived all their lives as in air-conditioned rooms. For them to go through this, uh, they are already uh, going through there. They'll, they'll certainly, once they are convicted, then of course they will lose their membership. In any case, they will not be able to get elected again. Are there any cases against Manmohan Singh for negligence as duty as of PM, or should there be any? Well, <laughs> certainly there can be cases, but I think uh, that should happen only when he becomes ex-Prime Minister. Because at this stage, filing such a case against him means he has to step down, which means Sonia Gandhi will be empowered to nominate the next Prime Minister. And we don't want to give her that power. So let him be there till time comes to remove the government as a whole. After that, Mr. Manmohan Singh will be shown his place. Given the current situation, do you think that the Congress Party will create chaos in India to divert public attention? Well, I don't... You, to create chaos, you need people. What people they have got? When they are challenged, you see, 
the congressmen are very mediocre people. Some uh, two, three years ago, uh, Narayan Kataria and Ari Sani in uh, New York, they uh, went to my website and found, uh, saw a document called Know Your Sonia, 100 pages of documents, of, I mean, about all about her and all her nefarious activities. They condensed it into a one-page advertisement in the New York Times and published it the day Sonia Gandhi arrived to deliver some lecture on Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, she came to New York. And this was front page, it was a full page advertisement in New York Times. Everybody saw it because New York Times is read by all diplomats. And she was enraged. And so she told the Congress party, here some uh, overseas Congress party, headed by some uh, Malotra, Dr. Malotra. And they filed a $100 million case against Narayan Kataria and uh, Arish Sani for defamation. What happened? They are foolish enough not to know that if you file a defamation case because you defamed Sonia Gandhi and the Congress party files it, the first question that the judge is going to ask is, where is Sonia Gandhi? Because she has to come on the witness box and depose. I would like to see Sonia Gandhi come on the witness box. There will be no Sonia Gandhi. Box. So the case got dismissed. What incompetent people these are. <laughs> they will run. We have seen it in 1977. What happened to Sonia Gandhi in 1977? She took her husband and two children and ran to the Italian embassy and hid there. Moraji Desai in my presence called the, America, the Italian ambassador because Indira Gandhi came crying, saying that she's taken my son also and my grandchildren also. So the Italian ambassador telephoned saying, you know, no, no threat, don't worry, we'll die, I'm Prime Minister of India, I'll take care. Then only they came out. In Bangladesh war also she left the country. So this time you only got to make sure that she doesn't leave the country. That's all. <laughs> Three more questions left. Uh, who besides the Aam Admi supports Ramdev Ji and Anna Hajare, any political parties, any business houses? Oh, political parties all want to support him, but he is, maybe he'll change now, but he was of the view that uh, politicians should be kept out because his people around him uh, wanted him out. I was our privilege to be present when he broke the fast, when it was decided. That only sons, only sadhus will go to uh, persuade him to give up the fast and give, I'll give him the orange juice class to break his fast. But I, I was made an exception. There are some people who are not happy, but uh, Bapu Murari explained that uh, Subramanian Swami has but Swami name, so therefore <laughs> he was also. <laughs> so there is a change. And I am hoping, because you, when you are dealing with politicians, you need politicians by your side. So, but I can say that Ramdev enjoys tremendous support in the country, and all political parties would like to be associated with him. I'm going to paraphrase this because the English is a little off. Uh, what is your opinion on why the BJP government, when it was in power, did, did not investigate Congress uh, functionaries, especially Sonia Gandhi? Well, I had filed a case in the Delhi High Court of two, three major charges against Sonia Gandhi. One was that she took money from KGB. And the proof I had was that when USSR collapsed and Yeltsin took over, the Americans coolly went into the KGB headquarters and photostatted every document and brought out the photostat and put it in Harvard University, Princeton University and Columbia University for scholars to study. So I, I was in Harvard University when, uh, when I was told that the, this big consignment from Soviet Union, from Russia has arrived. So I went and dug out uh, Sonia Gandhi's 
payments and all that from KGB. And uh, also the statement made by, uh, by the spokesman of the KGB that they were giving money to Rajiv Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi and Indira Gandhi because they were very pro-Soviet and therefore in the interest of Soviet Union we were giving them money. So I filed that in the court. Then I found that Sonia Gandhi was collecting uh, uh, antiques and paintings, rare paintings, as well as uh, idols from various temples and taking them to Italy, <coughs> smuggling them. By what route? By Air India planes. They were put without customs check and they were taken to Italy. There she had opened two shops in Italy, one in uh, a place called Rivolta, I think it's near Milan, and that was called uh, Etnica. And uh, the other shop was called Ganapati in our hometown of Orbasano. And these were kept there. Now both these are blue collar areas. Why would they be interested in buying Indian antiques? Obviously it was for some other purpose, was to prepare the billing for it and then take it to England and through Sotheby's sell it. So I filed that second case. Third case is that in our citizenship application, there is one very important question which has to be answered. Have you renounced your citizenship of your mother country, of the country which you uh, were holding. And Sonia Gandhi in the applications written, not applicable. Now what does that mean? So one officer, junior officer of the Home Ministry said she cannot be given citizenship because she has put this not applicable. Indira Gandhi has overruled it. Said no, 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 there is no need for her to answer this question. Because she is still a citizen. And therefore, I said our citizenship should be cancelled. Now I filed this case. The High Court was persuaded, so they asked the CBI, go and find out from these countries whether this is true about those first two charges. And CBI came back and said that Russia says we are willing to give you documents if you bring a letter rogatory, which means a letter from one court to a, another court in, in Russia, where which you and FIR is to be registered. And Italy also said the same thing. You bring a letter of Italy and we'll give you the documents. And they, uh, th that means also for Italy, you'd have to have an FIR. So the court asked the government, file an FIR. Vajpayee government refused to file it. Vajpayee also let uh, Rahul Gandhi off in Boston airport. He was carrying one lakh sixty thousand dollars. In his, uh, in his trunks and American law says you cannot bring in more than $10,000 unless uh, you declare it. And the punishment is eight years for every $10,000. So he had one lakh sixty thousand dollars which means 16 times. 16 times eight is 144 years. Mr. Vajpayee's government phoned up Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza I took it up with uh, Bush. FBI resisted for nine hours, saying, no, we will not give him up. Finally, they took an undertaking from him that whenever he is required in the United States uh, by the FBI, he will come here. And they let him go. Because since then, Rahul Gandhi has never come to America. Maybe you can invite him to Houston and see what the FBI does. <laughs> so, why did they do it? That I can't say. Maybe there's a cartel arrangement that I won't do anything to you, you don't do anything to me. I don't know what the problem is. There's only the BJP can answer. But certainly the way they handled Sonia Gandhi uh, was bad. The present president of BJP, Nitin Gadkari, his mind is clear. I can vouch for him. He is not afraid of Sonia Gandhi. But I think others seem to be a little afraid because there was one letter, strict letter, uh, uh, a rude letter written by Sonia Gandhi to Advani recently saying that one think tank committee of the BJP had said that Sonia Gandhi had money in uh, Swiss banks. 
So she wrote a very stiff letter. And Advani immediately apologized. What he should have said is, I am forwarding your letter to the think tank and asking them to answer you. That's what he should have done. Why should he apologize? So, uh, this is something you must ask the BJP people, but dal mein kuch kala jaruri hai. As a, as a follow-up to those three uh, lawsuits that you have filed, how, what is going on with those? How far are they? Well, I have at the moment in court uh, a uh, uh, case for Mr. Chidambaram, which is coming on 24th. I have a case in the trial court saying that Chidambaram should be made an accused. In the Supreme Court, I'm only saying CBI should be asked to investigate him. Because uh, I cannot ask the Supreme Court to make him an accused. The Supreme Court doesn't have that power. That power is with the trial court. And the trial court, uh, I have filed a petition, and that has been listed for 26th. And uh, uh, so in 24th, if the Supreme Court says yes, CBI should investigate, then this trial court is certain to make him a co-accused, which means next day he will have to uh, depart for Tihar. Uh, uh, so, uh, that is, the, these are the two main cases connected with the 2G, which are important. I have also one very important case, which is not connected with 2G, and that is that the electronic voting machine was rigged in the last parliament election where Congress got 90 extra seats. I have managed to show prima facie evidence of this in court and the court then asked me what is it that we can do, order the election commission do which will make you satisfy the electronic voting machine cannot be uh, rigged. And I said if they give like, uh, like the ATM, they give me a receipt. So now the election commission has agreed to give receipts and prepare the machine. And the formal order for that will be passed on the 17th of August. Uh, there are some other cases I have given to the Prime Minister a 221 pages document asking me, asking permission, <coughs> asking sanction to prosecute Sonia Gandhi on perforce. Uh, and that the Prime Minister is still sitting on it. So as soon as I go back, I'll go to the uh, Supreme Court. And because in Buffos, it is she who's centrally involved. And Rajiv Gandhi certainly abetted it. But the money went to uh, Sonia Gandhi's brother-in-law. Two brother-in-laws. She has two sisters and their husbands. But once they got the money, they divorced the two girls and went away. So they, <laughs> the sisters are now divorced. So, uh, therefore, I think Sonia Gandhi has to answer. And to be surprising, the entire Bofors investigation, Sonia Gandhi was never interrogated. So, this is another uh, matter which I'll file a fresh case when I go back. Last question. <laughs> Comes from Arya Samaj of Houston. They thank you for being scathingly honest uh, with your views on corruption and uh, the situation in, in, in India today. Uh, the question is, if will fixing it at the top work, isn't the fabric of India all distorted by now? Well, I am still very confident that the ordinary people are still sound. And this, I base it on number of developments over the years. People told me how Indian people will understand democracy. But when the voting came, they voted Indira Gandhi out. They voted uh, Jalita out in uh, 1996. Uh, they voted Karnandi out this time. They voted out the Marxists in, uh, in uh, Bengal. So, uh, all this public is, they were, they were, all the Yadavas voted for Nitish Kumar in Bihar. They don't vote for Lalu Yadav. So I think uh, I have much greater confidence in the armed public in India than the elite of India. The elite has become, 
the elite has become westernized, become totally materialistic. And some of them have become sickeningly. Look at this Ambani's. They have built a 27-story uh, house for a small family. This is ridiculous. And uh, this, this kind of crass uh, materialism is in the elite level. There I have no hope from. But the general public, they are very sound. We may be illiterates, but we are not uneducated. How do you restore your personal spirit? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, let us be clear that uh, there are a number of instances where personal security itself has killed the person who is supposed to be protected. Indira Gandhi was killed by her own security. Recently, that Salman Taseer of uh, Punjab governor of Pakistan, he was killed by his own personal security. I think uh, in uh, uh, Karzai's brother, in Kandahar was also recently killed by his personal security. So I don't think uh, personal security enhances uh, security. What uh, we need to do is know the modus operandi of people who want to harm you. And one of the things is they would like to see that they are not caught or things are not traced to them. Uh, of course, ultimately you need the support of God. If you are destined to live, you will live, no matter what happens. People have, I've known uh, where a plane, plane crash took place and only one person survived. Now, how did he survive? Uh, the building has collapsed and baby has survived. How did that baby survive? So, one is that, but more important is that uh, if you know the motors operandi and you have friends all over, and I do have, I don't ex I normally people don't publicize their enemies and publicize their friends, but I do the opposite. I publicize my enemies and don't publicize my friends. So I have friends who are also are very much concerned and uh, they look after me. But ultimately all the good wishes of the people gets translated into a message to God and therefore I'm quite confident it's not so easy to do what uh, people want to do. Swami, uh, wonderful lecture and of course it kind of goes back to your book on Hinduism under siege. Yes. And uh, one of the things that we were, we as students of Swami Dayana Saraswati were uh, very empowered was he was saying the slogan that Hindu vote is sacred. But this message has to go to the masses and uh, how do you foresee this happening? Because one thing I can hope is if that happens, we might see you as a Prime Minister of India, I think that would be a great uh, occasion. See, I think uh, these events that are happening, like this Bombay incident now, coming at the background of a large number of incidents, they will evoke that uh, sentiment and then it will be unstoppable. After all, in uh, the Ram movement, which uh, there's been disappointment that the BJP did nothing afterwards, the Ram movement propelled BJP from two seats in 1984 to 186 seats in 1998. So, I, I think uh, in India, people take a long time for something to ferment or what we in Sanskrit call as manthan. Manthan takes place, but that manthan is going on today. And I am 100% certain that the next election will be fought between Hindutva and uh, anti-national in these countries in our country. That's what I think. Sir, my question is little partisan, but you know, parties are involved in politics. You know that uh, Karnataka governor has given sanction against the Karnataka CM uh, for prosecution and Karnataka CM has challenged that why he has given the permission. So, starting from your first point of your lecture, what do you think? <laughs> When this coal scam, this teach, uh, CWG scam, I think Yadrilapa scam is like a traffic violation if you ask me. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I can't be exercised about that. Uh, he was caught, it, what, he, what happened was wrong, but he has returned the land and uh, I will not waste time on uh, pursuing Yadrapa because I don't think that in this perspective I should disperse my energy. I get a lot of people writing me all letters, why don't you take up this case, why don't you take up that case. It's not possible for me to. I have an opinion that Mr. Yadrapa uh, is being targeted by, uh, by Congress because they want to divert it. Uh, he has definitely, there is no doubt that his sons have, what they did was wrong. But this discretionary quota is being misused so many times. The only solution is that this discretionary quota should be ended. And uh, Mr. Yadrapa admits that his son should not have got it and he has returned it. So I would rather not give it any kind of priority. And as far as Bhardwaj is concerned, he is a, a crook of the first order himself and a big uh, chela of Sonia Gandhi. And if I were to bring out all his corruption, uh, you will make your hair stand on end. Uh, I don't believe anything he does. If he is giving sanction, it must be for purely political reasons. Uh, good evening, Dr. Sami. Great to talk to you on a day when your article in DNA Back Home is creating uproar in all social networking sites. Anyway, my question to you is, how do you think that the office of Jan Lokpal will not create more red tapeism back home? More what? More red tapeism. More red tapeism. Yes. Well, the opposition, uh, I told you that as far as the, that uh, uh, it's not opposition, it is Azare's, Anna Azare's. Jan Lokpal bill is uh, only the only point on which I am uh, feel that it's uh, something you can take a stand on. Whether Prime Minister should be included or not, Prime Minister is included in the Prevention of Corruption Act. He is not excluded there. So uh, I, I don't think you need specially to mention in the Lokpal that the Prime Minister is also covered. Uh, and consequently, the only thing that is of value is the independent public prosecutor and that is to reduce red tape and not to increase it. Swami. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, wonderful lecture. My question goes back. You really scared Ms. Jalalita in Tansi case. Really, she came out of that chief minister post and appointed some other person and she, this kind of people have forgotten the Tansi case. And now, did the same thing happen in 2G scam? Just 21, even if they full penalty, 21 years they need to see just four or five lots of session. Again, do they come back to power? Do they do the, another mischievous thing? Well, as far as the Tansi case is concerned, 2G case, there's a fundamental difference. As far as Tansi case is concerned, I launched that case. I got her uh, sent to jail on that issue. And then Karuna Nidhi became jealous that I was getting all this publicity. He, uh, as chief minister and a beneficiary of my campaign against uh, Jayalalitha, he then suddenly said, no, no, all these cases will be handled by the state government. And uh, since in those days, uh, you know, the uh, uh, state government uh, was uh, um, uh, just newly elected, so the courts also said yes. The state government can handle it. Swami doesn't have a, the, the requisite staff to continue the prosecution. And they handed it back. And then after that, Karnanini must have made a deal with Jayalalitha that, you know, of the loot you made, give me 30% and I'll let you go. And that's how she escaped. This one, the CBI is directly under the Supreme Court. And I am a petitioner in, uh, in the Supreme Court. And therefore, it's not comparable at all. And I can tell you that 2G will not go. And let's not all the time think that because in the past something went wrong, in the future will also go wrong. We worry too much about these things. You see, if my, uh, my wife is pregnant, if the child is born and his nose is twisted, who will marry that child? I mean, you start worrying about it even before the child is born, you see. Uh, I don't think we should worry these things. The 2G is a commitment of the country. And uh, I think uh, we are completely differently placed and therefore the repeat of that will not take place. Just quick question. What do you think about this National Advisory Council? <laughs> the way they put all these you know, recommendations, that will 
totally make us prisoners. Well, it is a body to give her cabinet status and uh, whether it is legal or not, uh, nobody has so far challenged it. But the real problem is not uh, the National Advisory Council, it is the fact that the Prime Minister is unable to stand up to Sonia Gandhi. That is the real problem. The rest of the Congress party also doesn't stand up to her. There, uh, that's where the real ills uh, uh, come in the country, in governance, and I think that's where it needs to be corrected. In NAC, you have one more council that is there, it doesn't matter, you have national security, NIA, this, that, so many others. I don't think these things will make a fundamental difference. Dr. Swami, uh, thank you. I mean, you are doing a tremendous job. Uh, we have just two more questions, I think, and then we'll, uh, I think we'll try to wrap it up. Uh, one, this question, and one more last question from... Uh, uh, my question is, uh, why can't India change its name to Bharat? India's name has already changed to Bharat, it's there in the constitution, India that is Bharat. What uh, many people ask is why it can't be named Hindustan? That is a, a separate uh, issue for which you need a constitutional amendment. But as far as Bharat is concerned, it is uh, uh, in all uh, in Hindi, whenever a circular comes in Hindi, it will be Bharat Sarkar, it will not come as Indian government or the Republic of India. I think this would be, should be the last question, or not? Namaste. Okay. Uh, question is, since Nehru Gandhi family has looted so much from 1947, why don't we have a movement to remove Nehru Gandhi dynasty and get rid of them? Yes. 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 Well, let's all take a pledge that there will be a Nehru holiday. <laughs> so, uh, if that gets translated, uh, you will see. Let's see what happens in, uh, in the coming elections. I think the, the, what you have just expressed it seems to be a general sentiment. Even in India, they are very ya, in the chutti karo. See, so I think uh, you will get your wish. Uh, only the thing is that they, they, they should also pay for all the things that they have done wrong right from Kashmir in 1947, right up to today uh, on terrorism. They have done so many things against the country. They have to be made, uh, brought to account for that. Dr. Swami, just, just one more last question, very quick one, just one. Respected sir, what is your opinion on smaller states in India? What is your opinion on? Smaller states, oh, I am in favor of them. I think India should have 50 states. Uh, all the smaller states are doing better than before. Uttarakhand is doing much better than before. Chhattisgarh is doing much better than before. Jharkhand is doing much better than before. Uh, I, I think uh, we need 50 states. Telangana should uh, was due long time ago, 1956 itself. And, th and Telangana should be definitely conceded. Vidarbha should be conceded. What is wrong? They are all within the country. Uh, why should we, we uh, you know, not give? It's usually vested interests who are objecting to it. I think the small states are necessary wherever there is a substantial demand. Uh, I have already told you uh, in the very beginning that uh, 14th May there is a uh, at Herman Park a 14th August, excuse me, 14th August in Herman Park in near Gandhi statue there is a demonstration. And uh, since uh, people from other parts of the country in the United States are also uh, looking forward to <laughs> very brave, very erudite, very knowledgeable. Thank you for coming. I would ask, I would, I would just for take one second to thank Mr. Pradeep Parekh, who has been uh, single-handedly, you know, put together this program and he has been an inspiration to work with. And he has done a tremendous job. So, big hand for Mr. Pradeep Parekh as well. I would ask Pradeep Ji to please give a few closing comments to close this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I really 
uh, just want to say thank you to Dr. Swami. Uh, he has traveled long distance to deliver a splendid message that we all needed to hear. And, uh, you know, to work with uh, people like uh, my colleagues at Hindu Mahasabha, Dharminder and Rudrath and Dilip Bhai and all those, Jai Shah, uh, it makes it a pleasure, really. So thank you again, and please support Hindu Mahasabha. Thank you.